I'm Zara Gall. I'm a consultant endourologist at Stepping Hill Hospital in Stockport. And together with Ben, we're going to be presenting the roundup session for the posters on stones, imaging and upper tract disorders. Hello there, my name is Ben Gray. I'm also a consultant endourologist working in Manchester as part of Manchester University Foundation Trust. Um, the quality of posters this year, as ever, has been extremely high and we congratulate all the teams on their hard work and effort in preparing them. Um, to give everyone equal airtime, we're, we're going to be very strict on time, but I really would encourage you all to go online and, and um, review these posters because there's an audio commentary that um, accompanies most of them. We're going to alternate between the two, so the first poster is going to be reviewed by Zara. Thanks, Ben. So this is the first poster. It's presented by George Zoo and is the first of three posters we're going to see from Kay Thomas and Matt Voltitude's group at Guy's and St Thomas. So traditionally, it's been taught that cystinuria is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, i.e. you have to have two affected genes, one from each parent, in order to display signs of the disease. But this poster describes 20 patients who have heterozygote mutations of the SLC7A9 gene, but display symptoms of cystinuria. And within these 20, there were a number of different genetic mutations. So this suggests that the inheritance may actually be autosomal dominant with incomplete penetrance. So it's a very interesting poster. And as the authors conclude, there's need for much more research to define the exact inheritance patterns in cystinuria. To me, it's a really good example of the value of a regional or, or rather a national centre specialising in these rarer genetic conditions, because only with that setup will you get the numbers needed for this sort of research. I don't know if you've got any comments, Ben. No, I mean, of course, it is a very interesting piece of work and I, I echo everything you've said. Um, I, I suppose, you know, this is the sort of thing that maybe, uh, I'm sure the guys are well ahead on this, but, you know, whether a biobank might be something that um, could help um, look into this mutation further and, and the heterozygosity and, and obviously all regions around the UK would be happy to feed into that, I'm sure. Yeah. Great. So, um, over to you with the second poster, Ben. Yeah, so again, um, this is a poster presented by um, Robert Ash and um, reports from Guys and Tommies again. Um, this is a, a study looking at the experience of ladies um, with cystinuria uh, whilst pregnant. Um, albeit that the, the team there have a specialist clinic with large cohorts of patients, this study is applicable to all of us, I think, because we all have female cystinuria patients of um, childbearing age and equally many stone formers that aren't cystinurics that a lot of these challenges um, uh, you know, are applicable to them as well. Such challenges in real life are, as identified by the authors, radiation exposure, thiol-based treatments having to be stopped, the contraindication of shockwave lithotripsy and, and potentially the increased risks of endourological treatments. I think it's noteworthy that most of these patients were pregnant prior to being referred to guys, but when they used the questionnaire to uh, analyze the experience of these ladies during pregnancy, they found that um, just under a third had had any specific advice about cystinuria during pregnancy. Um, about half became symptomatic whilst pregnant, about a quarter needed intervention, and a third had to stop their meds. I suppose the overarching statistic that is poignant is, is that about a fifth felt that cystinuria was still a barrier to pregnancy. I think their conclusions are, are very fair and uh, it raises the point that we, we really need to address the anxiety for stone formers, particularly cystinuria during pregnancy. It's already a difficult time for many ladies uh, and I'm sure the team are well on with plans again for trying to combat this. Um, I mean, I've got some thoughts, but Zara, have you got any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it's quite small numbers, but that's inevitable given, given the rarity of the, um, the disease and, and you're only looking at the pregnant patients amongst those. Um, I, I did wonder whether it's, there's a role for, particularly in the COVID era, and we've all got much more used to virtual clinics, um, with the national um, spread of these patients, whether it would be something that um, the National Centre could run a sort of virtual clinic for um, either pregnant patients or patients that are considering um, becoming pregnant um, to, to talk them through the, the issues surrounding that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So should we move on to post number three? Yeah. So this is a retrospective review of 113 parathyroidectomies. 
So 35% of them had had documented renal stones prior to their surgery, um, and only 14% developed stones during the post-operative period. So as one would expect, following parathyroidectomy, their serum calcium, serum PTH, and 24-hour urine calcium levels all fell. Um, but despite these levels normalizing, the patient's levels of stone formation were still higher than that in the general population. Um, so certainly that um, reflects my experience of these patients. I think it's helpful in terms of counseling patients, um, telling them that, you know, if they have a parathyroidectomy, it certainly reduces their chance of stone formation, but doesn't eliminate it or doesn't necessarily get it down to normal levels. Um, it's just a theory, but I would suspect that's because during the time they've been hypercalciuric, they've developed very small um, stones, and then those act as anidus for, for further stone growth. But that's just my sort of thoughts on the, the likely reasons. Um, any, anything to add, Ben? Not, not really, other than the fact to flag the sort of counselling that patients aren't necessarily, this isn't going to necessarily be the perfect panacea for them. Um, and and their the stone risk is still there the, in, in the background, I guess, as you've said. Okay. So, next one. So, this is a study presented by Sophie Thompson from the group in Birmingham and looks at screening for hyperuricemia in stone formers. Um, Ms. Thompson um, identifies that there is conflicting guidance as to whether to measure serum urate from uh, the EAU and AUA guidance and, and recent NICE guidance. They looked at 327 patients of theirs that had had a stone analysis and of these 56% had had a urate blood test. Not unsurprisingly, they found that an increased serum urate was more common in those with uric acid stones and mixed uric acid stones, uh, but was still uh, high in about a quarter of their calcium-based stone uh, formers. Um, they also showed that there was an increased chance of people receiving medical prophylaxis with allopurinol or potassium citrate uh, with uric acid stones than, than calcium oxalate. I think the, the aims of the study were to look at a relationship between hyperuricemia and stone type, and of course we've confirmed that, and, and it was, uh, I, I guess hyperuricemia, as we say, as we know, is, is, is a marker of acidity of the urine and a, a propensity potentially for um, stone formation, but <clears throat> I'm still a little confused as to whether it would stop me or doing uh, a urate blood test. I guess if, if I was contemplating allopurinol, for example, for a uric acid stone form, I'd want to know their serum urate. Um, would it stop me alkalizing the urine? Probably not, because I'd still do that based on urinary pH. Um, and, and the association between BMI and male sex, well, I, I guess we wouldn't treat the urine necessarily, we would treat the BMI and the other risk factors. So I think it's an interesting start of the study um, and, and I would congratulate them on opening the topic up. Anything to add to that, Zara? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, we still routinely check it, um, despite it not being on the NICE guidance, we do um, still routinely check it and find it to be raised in a surprisingly high number of people, particularly as um, obesity is becoming ever more prevalent. So, Moving on, um, this is a poster from Glasgow describing the introduction of their electronic referral system to the endourology MDT. Um, this is a problem that I'm sure many of us who are involved in stone MDTs face, um, reviewing a CT scan of a stone, but having absolutely no clinical information about the background of the patient, how they presented. Uh, and without that clinical information, it's impossible to, for the MDT to make any sensible management plan. So the group in Glasgow, together with their IT department, developed an electronic referral form. Um, they demonstrated that there was an increase from 34.4% referral completeness before the introduction of the form to 93.9% after. Um, so clearly we agree that there is definitely a, an issue here that needs resolving um, and the results sound fantastic. I'm a little bit worried. We've just got one um, concern about electronic forms. If the form requires a yes, no answer in order for you to proceed, um, then there's a temptation if the, if the information is missing for the, in order for the, patient, the person to submit the re referral, they almost have to make up the answer to the question if they don't know it. So it's really important when designing these electronic forms that there is, um, for example, if it says diabetes, yes, no, 
there must also be an option for information unavailable. Otherwise, you risk getting a 100% data set, but the data that you've collected is actually rubbish. Now, I'm not saying that's the case with this poster because I haven't seen their actual electronic referral form, um, but it just does raise slight suspicions when, if you look at the, the central part of the poster where the results are displayed, the green forms that where everything is 100%, um, you know, have they had a pacemaker? It's 100% um, data set. And that just makes me slightly concerned that that, that could be a, a risk there. Um, but I might be entirely wrong. So uh, apologies if I am. Anything else to add, Ben, on this? No, other than my fear of persuading colleagues to fill out pro formas um, would ensue. <laughs> but I mean, generally, I think we need to congratulate the group in, in doing this because obviously, um, we don't get as much admin support uh, than, than the cancer MDT, so anything that can help would be, would be useful. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> Definitely a problem that needs addressing. Following on from this study, the next poster also looks at um, stone MDT work, and, and uh, I think we should congratulate Ashley Memi and the Bristol group for a nice poster which summarises their innovative approach to virtual working, and, and I should note that this was pre-pandemic as well. Uh, many of us have, have embraced it during the pandemic, but uh, they were ahead of the curve. Um, the team undertook uh, a weekly review of all stone cases referred from their emergency department and, and managed to do this via a stone MDT within 1.9 days. Um, the nurse specialist review uh, subsequent to this happened within 12 days and there was a second review at four to six weeks by a nurse and uh, radiographer. There were always the options for people to come off that pathway and see a consultant for enhanced uh, on an enhanced care pathway where it was deemed necessary. Um, as I said before, I think I think the team should be congratulated on on being so forward thinking and bringing the decision making about uh, acute stones uh, right forward in the pathway rather than letting them linger and see if they're going to pass and then making decisions. Um, the, the only comment I would say in slight criticism, although uh, forgive me if I've missed this, but th there are some assumptions that you know, this, this data isn't uh, comparative. And whilst it's likely to be correct that sepsis rates and quality of uh, re reduced and quality of life improved, I think you can only assume this rather than uh, you know, confirm it because we haven't got any supportive data. Um, I don't know whether you were going to comment on this, Laura, but it, the other thing was whether we needed to bring the final decision forward from four to six weeks. It wasn't clear whether that was a, they were treated by four to six weeks or whether the, the, the final decision about treatment was at that stage. Yeah, I'd be interested to know what day of the week they have their stone MDT on, because it seems amazing that they're seeing, uh, on average, they're seeing patients within 1.9 days of referral. Um, so I don't know how you know, maybe all their stone patients happen to present uh, just a day or two before their stone MDT. Seems a, it seems a very quick response, but um, yeah, good work. Awesome. So this next poster from Dr. Pingale and colleagues in India looks at this um, much studied topic of how to alleviate symptoms associated with ureteric stents. Um, so I'm probably going to start by being a little bit cheeky and state the obvious, that, which is that the best way to avoid stent symptoms, of course, is not to insert a stent at all. And routine post ureteroscopy stenting should really be a thing of the past. They should only have stents inserted if there's a, a clear indication for one. However, in some patients, there is a clear indication for stents, and therefore the question that this um, poster is looking to address is still very much relevant. So the authors present a randomized controlled trial of 400 patients who had stents put in after endourological surgery. They were divided into four equal groups who received placebo, tamtulosin, solifenosin, and then a combination of both tamtulosin and solifenosin. And they were assessed by the USSQ, which is a validated symptom questionnaire for patients with stents. The results showed that the combination group showed significant improvements across all domains, including quality of life. Um, so as I say, there's been lots of studies similar to this previously. Um, I don't routinely use medical therapy to prevent stent symptoms. I don't know whether, um, whether others do, um, but certainly in patients who've had stents previously and found them very uncomfortable, um, then it might be something to consider prophylactically or otherwise just um, for treatment of those who complain of stent symptoms afterwards. Um, I don't know if you've got any other comments about this poster, Ben. 
No, I mean, um, I mean, they were large numbers. I'm no statistician, but there was no obvious powering of that for, for, yeah. for, the, for the differences. Um, I also thought it was in, interesting about the stent they use. I mean, I appreciate they've probably done it to try and control for the study so the stent length didn't impact. But of course, stent length, there are there is conflicting data about stent length, whether it crosses the midline, the distal loop, all those sort of things. There are data for and against whether that impacts on symptoms. So I don't know whether they could have controlled for that better, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah they inserted the same size, that five branch, twenty-four centimeter stent in every single patient. Which, given there must have been quite a variety of sizes of patients, it seemed, uh, yeah. yeah, slightly surprising. Okay, moving on. Yeah. So the next one is a, a study again from guys, but this time teaming up with the t uh, with the um, urology team from Royal Berkshire and Katie Eyre presented this poster. Uh, I have to say, I really like this poster. It was really clear, it was well set out and um, it's a topic that is important to end urologists but also general urologists. And we all see hematuria as our bread and butter, um, but persistent visible hematuria and those people that keep bleeding um, is far more challenging. Um, the teams presented 13 patients who'd bled despite a normal CT urogram and flexible cystoscopy and, found, and report on 12 patients who went on to, be found, uh, went on to have flexible urethroscopy and angiodysplasia was found. The 13th patient had multiple hemoglobinopathies. Of those 12, uh, cautery at flexible urethros urethroscopy um, led to immediate resolution of the bleeding. A further uh, patient had to have a procedure four years later and then it subsequently stopped and one was left with mild symptoms but were bothersome. I think the, the take home for me is that this is a far more, whilst it's still relatively rare, um, it's a far more a clearer indication to go ahead with uh, flexible urethroscopy in these patients and of course that would bring in endurologists like us. Um, it reminds me to think of the hemoglobin office, can't say it, but think of it, and um, potentially consider the role for a hot cystoscopy to see if there is any lateralizing uh, bleeding. Um, the, the only questions I would have uh, would have been CT angio. I, there's, I wasn't quite clear on the, on the data there, whether everyone had one or, and, or whether it was just the five that were negative. You got any thoughts on that, Tara? I had a patient like this fairly recently, actually, who had persistent hematuria, always associated with right loin pain, and had a cystoscopy showing um, blood coming from the the right UO, um, and had uh, flexible urethroscopy and laser ablation of a of an area that looked very similar to that picture there, um, with complete resolution. Um, that was going to be my one comment, though. I I lasered the area affected. Um, and this comments on cauterization with diathermy, which I was a bit confused by because I'm not aware of any electrodes that you can insert up a urethroscope. So I wonder whether they do mean laser ablation rather than diathermy. Really interesting if they could put that in the chat if the any of the team are there yeah. <laughs> um, when we're live. Yeah, it's a shame we haven't been able to uh, to speak with them about that. But, um, but, it was good but yeah, I agree. Point. Really, really nice poster. So the next one. So this is the third offering from the uh, guys and St. or actually the fourth from the guys and St. Thomas group. Um, it's a retrospective review of 144 upper tract urothelial biopsies taken endoscopically. Um, a problem obviously with ureteroscopic biopsies is they can be very small and therefore sometimes non-diagnostic. So of these 144, 37 of their biopsies were from lesions in the renal pelvis and all of them were diagnostic and 107 were ureteric biopsies and 92.3% of those were diagnostic. So this only left 12 out of the total of 144 um, that were equivocal or non-diagnostic and needed further investigation. So the authors attribute these excellent outcomes to, to three factors, the use of Bowen solution dedicated uropathologists and limiting um, the people taking these biopsies to high volume ureteroscopists. Um, so I certainly think it is an area that requires expertise, both in terms of the pathologists and the ureteroscopists. Um, but certainly in our institution, that's something that's probably becoming more and more difficult as we're doing less, we're doing fewer and fewer um, upper tract biopsies because wherever possible, we're trying to offer them definitive treatment straight off. 
Um, partly because if there's a clear upper tract um, TCC, we don't want to delay um, their uh, final treatment, but mainly because of the risk of tumour seeding. Um, and there's more and more evidence that doing a ureteroscopy um, increases the risk of um, bladder recurrences afterwards. So we only do them in really equivocal cases, which means obviously that the pathologists are seeing fewer of these biopsies and we're taking fewer of them. Um, Buin solution, I'm not an expert. I, we don't use it in our institution. I thought it had gone out of favour, I must say, because it's um, volatile and difficult to store. Um, but as I say, I'm, I don't really know enough about it. And clearly you're getting um, very good results with it at, uh, at Guy's and St. Thomas. So, Any other comments, Ben? No, I mean, maybe a couple of things for the chat. Um, I, I'm afraid I just couldn't get my head around and I, I would be really interested to know what happened to the four false negatives. I couldn't work out the figures um, as to what happened to them, because obviously that's a, a slight concern, a false negative um, and missing a tumour. And the other thing that would be interesting is to know whether the team use narrowband imaging, any sort of adjuncts to digital uh, ureteroscopy, basically. But perhaps anyone present could put that in the chat. Yeah. Okay. We we'll move on to um, David Manson Barr from the Royal Marsden and the team there, um, who report one of a couple of posters. Well, there are a couple of posters on uh, malignant ureteric obstruction. Um, the team acknowledged the fact that this is something that many urologists see relatively regularly, sadly, but um, it, it also acknowledges the interplay between benefit of um, disobstructing someone versus the potential impact on their quality of life. I think this poster mainly serves uh, in a, cancer, a prostate cancer population to identify those at risk of a poorer benefit, i.e. poorer oncological outcome, which may in turn inform discussions about whether intervention is appropriate. Of the 63 patients that they pulled from their uh, stent registry, who'd had a stent for prostate cancer and, uh, uh, sorry, ureteric obstruction, secondary to prostate cancer, um, they noted that 54% had died within 12 months. And they clearly, with multivariate analysis, showed that there were some risk factors for a poorer survival, namely um, blood tests, albumin less than 35, a hemoglobin less than 112, uh, but interesting, not any uh, creatinine wasn't indicative. They also noted that there was an association with a retrograde approach to stenting being more favorable with regards to survival which may be something to do with the suitability for anaesthetic, I guess, or the size of the prospect, you know, the degree of local advanced disease. The conclusions that I draw, drew from it really was that it was a nice uh, paper that demonstrated um, some risk factors for poorer survival. And that's the sort of thing that you could feed into those difficult decisions. I guess um, it's not comparative, so we don't really know how uh, a, a non-stented population would have fared. And... Um, Often these patients, albeit that they could be found with an asymptomatic hydronephrosis on a scan, a lot of them are already in extremis with hyperkalemia or fluid overload and, and need some intervention then. And it's possibly not the easiest decision for someone to make acutely. Anything from your side, Zara? Yeah, uh, nothing to add really. I mean, it, the conclusion here really is that low HB and albumin predicts a poor outcome in prostate cancer patients probably because they have extensive marrow infiltration and very advanced disease. So um, it's just trying to, you know, identify those that are really end stage and may, for whom palliation may be, may be more appropriate, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's a nicely presented poster. The next one is along a similar theme, really. This poster is presented by Sam Folkard on behalf of the BATS um, health team. It's a retrospective study looking at 105 patients who had nephrostomies inserted for obstructing pelvic malignancy. They found that the mean survival after nephrostomy insertion was 139 days, and 68% of the patients who had nephrostomies in did not have any further oncological treatment. 39% had at least one 30-day admission, um, and only 10% of the patients who had nephrostomies inserted were discussed at the MDT prior to um, the NEF inserted, NEF being inserted. Um, unfortunately, again, there is no control group. There's no data on the group of patients who didn't have a nephrostomy inserted in these circumstances. 
Um, but nonetheless, this information is useful to inform patients um, that there is certainly morbidity and readmission risk with NEF insertion. Um, again, the conclusion to discuss at MDT, uh, like you said before in the previous poster, it, there's often no time to do that because they've presented in extremists and the decision needs making there and then. Um, but even if there is time, I don't feel it's a decision necessarily that an MDT can make away from the patient. The MDT can certainly uh, um, give an opinion, um, but the final decision is going to come at the time that the clinician is having that discussion with the patient. The patient needs to be very much involved um, in these decisions. Um, so yeah, similar to the last one. Any other comments? Really, no. It just provides the other side to the argument, doesn't it? Um, yeah, very similar. So this paper is from UCH and presented by Giorgio Mazon and um, is about the, their experience of rendezvous. Um, again, I really enjoyed this paper. I thought it was presented very clearly and unambiguous um, in, in the data presentation. It, it describes the group's 14 years uh, experience of rendezvous and includes all those patients that had at least 12 months of follow-up. They split the, the cohort into two groups, group A being those with late oncological post-surgical uh, ureteric strictures or discontinuity, and group being the more acute phase uh, with leakage detachment or an early surgical obstruction. Um, uh, I think most of us would uh, know the procedure with regards to rendezvous procedure, but once they've got uh, a stent across, they managed to get a stent across, should I say, in 84.6 and 88.3% of cases respectively. Uh, post stent removal and during uh, very careful follow-up, um, both groups ended up having to have a ureteric reimplantation in about 11%. Um, group B had an 11% uh, uh, chance of memocath insertion, uh, which was lower in group A at 3.8. But I think the most uh, startling difference was the fact that uh, in group B, so the more acute uh, interventions, 64% of patients uh, needed nothing further, so were stent and prosthesis free. In group A, this figure was about half that, of around 30, uh, it was 30.7%, uh, with 38% of patients in that group still requiring chronic stenting. So I think the take home message for me is, you know, rendezvous procedure, very effective in, in uh, experienced hands, and perhaps the more acute case um, carries a better prognosis. Yeah, I agree. It was really nicely presented. It's a, you know, procedure that endourologists love, you know, working closely with your interventional radiology colleagues to achieve a, a, a result in a minimally invasive fashion. It's something that's uh, really enjoyable to do. And this is a really nice uh, summary of their um, results. So the next one is presented by Wissam El Baroni. It presents this poster. Um, from colleagues in Belfast on their 12 year experience of using Memocath stents. So during that time, they've inserted 93 stents in 75 patients. Um, the complications during that time, 40% of them had migrated, 25% obstructed and 33% are still functioning. Of course, that's with quite a variable um, follow-up time because some of them were from 12 years ago, some of them much more recently. So they conclude that Memocaths should be considered as a semi-permanent, as many will migrate or obstruct over time, but they can be useful and they've used them particularly in patients who have been finding double J stents particularly difficult to um, tolerate. I've no personal experience using Memocath stents. I don't know whether you do, Ben, or if you've got any other comments. No, I, I, I don't either. Um, the, the sort of feeling I had when I read this was it was a bit like the optical urethrotomy um, discussion that we often have. Well, I was always taught that an optical urethrotomy for a, a relatively uncomplicated urethral stricture had a 50% chance of success long term. If you then recurred, then you were always going to head towards either palliation with recurrent urethrotomies or formal reconstruction. It sort of feels like you get a chance at getting away with it with a memocath. And if you don't, then you're going ahead with, with some reconstruction. Whether that memocath uh, makes that reconstruction harder or less likely to succeed. It'd be interesting to know from the authors if they have any experience with that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> following on, the, 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 the next one is uh, the, the same sort of topic of chronic uh, ureteric reconstruction. And this is presented by Christopher Koo from Imperial Urology. Um, it's the final three objects, as I said, looking at strategies for 
uh, relief of ureteric strictures. Um, it's their initial experience of the allium ureteric stent, and there's a retrospective review of 27 stents placed in 21 ureters in 16 patients. Um, in 96% of the cases, they could insert the stent. Um, the strictures were, seemed to be pretty long, an average of eight centimetres. The functional dwell time was nine months overall, but there was a clear difference between the patho underlying pathology. And 5.5 months was the average for a malignant stricture, but we got to tw they got up to 21 months for benign, and, and in a subset of that, in the retroperitoneal fibrosis patients, 32 months. Um, it appeared that the risk of obstruction of those stents was worse when in the distal and mid ureters. My conclusion from this was that, um, you know, the um, results appear promising, particularly for the benign and especially RPF uh, groups, particularly we've got a, a proximal benign stricture. Um, would 5.5 months beat a nephrostomy or a standard stent? I I'm not sure yet. Any yeah, again, I've got no experience because our hospital won't pay for them, but uh, it's a promising start, promising uh, data, isn't it? Yeah. And that takes us on to the uh, final poster, which is a really nice poster from uh, Sarah Ramsey in Inverness, along with her interventional radiology colleagues. It describes a technique that they've developed for managing nephrostomy drainage in a very large geographical area with many island communities, where getting to hospital for nephrostomy exchanges can be very difficult. So the interventional radiologist inserts a six French nephrostomy in the standard way, and then upsizes it to a 16 French Foley catheter using the um, commercially available Seldinger SPC set. Um, the district nurses then change the catheters every 12 weeks in the community um, so that the patients don't have to travel. So I really like this, it's a great practical solution to the problem. Um, a 16 French stent, uh, catheter is much less likely to block. Um, they're very easy to exchange. Um, my first thought with this is that I think the Highland district nurses must be, must be a much uh, hardier breed than we have around here because we struggle to get our district nurses to flush a nephrostomy, never mind to, to exchange one. Um, so hats off to them. Um, but I think it's a, a really nice poster and I think there's potential to roll this out to, to many places. I mean, just thinking at the moment, it would be great if patients had much bigger drainage tubes like this, it would reduce the risk of admissions with blockages, um, etc. which when we're trying to reduce uh, people's admissions to hospital at the moment seems very sensible. So really nice poster. Any other comments, Ben? Oh, yes, it, we're trying to reduce admissions, but yet we're forced to defunction more people and defer their surgery, sadly. But, and then there is the risk with the second wave, certainly in Manchester, that that might happen, but uh, yeah. hopefully not. And, it, and this is this is just encompasses end urology, isn't it? Innovative use yeah. of kit that you've got. So, uh, yeah, well done. Yeah. So that concludes the poster session on stones imaging and upper tract disorders. And as Ben said before, I'd really... Uh, I hope this has whetted your appetite to go and view the posters online because the authors giving their their own um, commentary you'll you'll get a lot more out of than our very uh, whistle stop tour that we've uh, we've had to give you today. But yeah, really encourage you to go on and look at them. Thank you.